A very good afternoon from a somewhat overcast Christchurch. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, we have the fourth and final webinar in the series now beginning. And I'm especially pleased to be uh, joined today by a series of invited guests and panelists, um, some of whom you will know, um, no doubt know, others perhaps not so familiar. So I would like to begin by introducing our panelists for today. Um, first up, of course, is Jim. Uh, Jim, if you'd like to turn your camera on, I'm sure we've got to know you pretty well. Um, but Jim Wilson, uh, there are some a number of new people, 20 or so new folk joining us today, so a quick introduction for their benefit. Um, first of all, I just before um, referring to Jim, I will certainly say uh, thank you to the recent um, attendees that have signed up for this fourth and final webinar. A special welcome to you and with all those who are returning from former sessions. Jim uh, is Chief Technology Officer of Ag Gateway and Chief Executive Officer of Open Applications Group and very experienced. Jim, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here, Kenneth. Uh, you want me to go ahead and present? Uh, I'll just introduce the others first. Um, okay, following, Jim, following Jim will be Sir Bill English, whom we all will know for sure. Um, welcome, uh, Sir Bill. We're grateful for your attendance today and we're looking forward to your perspectives. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, next in the lineup is going to be Alexi Rostapshoff. Alexi is the head of John Deere Labs, based in San Francisco. Welcome, Alexi. Thanks, Kenneth. Looking forward to uh, connecting with all of you and, and sharing a little bit more about John Deere's perspective on things here as well today. Super, and thank you, Alexi. We're actually pleased for you that you and your wife got marooned in Nelson. Uh, <laughs> because it means you can you can join us today, so very grateful for that. Following Alexi is going to be David Downs. Um, most, if not all of us, will know David. Welcome, David. Uh, kia ora, tēnā koe. Nice to have, have you here. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're looking forward to you joining the dots for us between ITP, the work that you're doing on the All, all um, Government uh, Working Party, and then we're going to move to uh, uh, Andrew Cook. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Kenneth. Andrew's start button, there he is. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, I, you need to lend me your hairdresser because I'm way over overground here. So <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Thank you. And then that's it for the panellists for today. Uh, as you know, uh, Tim Cutfield is supporting this, this webinar series, particularly by curating the questions and answers. Before I hand it to Jim, very quickly, we do expect and hope that today will be a lot more interactive uh, than before. The first three webinars obviously were designed to be instructional and educational and informative, and we trust that's the case. Uh, but today, I'm sure with the range of panelists we've got and the ideas and um, thoughts and concepts that are being put forward, I'm sure we'll have a robust interaction. So uh, welcome. With that, I will hand to Jim. Jim, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, so this is the uh, fourth of four webinars. Uh, I will recap the first three that we did. I also spoke at Mobile Tech on 17 April on that virtual event. And uh, here we are, finally at, at the fourth and final one about application and benefits for New Zealand and the ITP. Just wanna point out all the folks that made this uh, webinar series possible, First Precision Ag Association of New Zealand, Agritech New Zealand, uh, the two organizations merging, of course, Mobile Tech being very kind in, in helping to promote this, Ag Gateway and OEG, the organizations I work with, and then uh, Kenneth Iron's tireless efforts in kind of coaching and organizing and uh, really bringing people together. So let's recap the first three sessions. We started out by addressing business fundamentals, relationship to interoperability, and the dynamics of collaboration versus competition. Interestingly, I had a conversation with a farmer this afternoon asking about the dynamics of collaboration for, versus competition and how Ag Gateway pulls off bringing competitors together, like John Deere and CNH and Agco and others. So that was a good discussion. Uh, also, uh, we discussed major standards influencers from the four big de jure standards organizations through national standards bodies, 
industry associations, a couple big even personalities, business, government, and others. Then we discussed the importance of process, how critical it was to provide context for data standards. We also addressed process-related standards, did a couple of examples. And then we get into what we got into what most people think of as sort of the meat and potatoes of integration, and that was the message standards. We talked about various message standards from all sorts of standards bodies. And then we talked about reference data and semantic infrastructure. We emphasized how important semantics are. You can, you can come to agreement on what shape data is in, in terms of its structures and data types. But if you don't know what the values mean that populate that structure, you're kind of lost. And then finally, we talked about data security, all sorts of elements of data security, data rights delegation. We discussed the New Zealand Farm Data Code of Practice. We discussed its equivalent in North America. Kenneth asked me to say, okay, given all of this, and given that I have read and commented on the New Zealand Ag ITP in detail, as I stated and during the first webinar, I read it and, and it really blew me away. It was really, really good. Where Ag Gateway lives is kind of in Workstream 4. Two slides on recommendations. So first of all, get started. Identify two or three product, uh, projects that meet the following criteria. It addresses a clearly understood problem, each of them. Uh, the deliverables are clear and implementable. It can be completed in six weeks or less. Uh, the domain and technical experts are available to contribute to the work. And, uh, and an important point here, there's no need to identify what the best projects are. There need, need not be any debate over it. The idea about is about beginning a process that can be repeated to the point of an ongoing operation. So let's say you pick the fourth and fifth best project, so to speak. No big deal. If you do the work well, that will, at some point, you'll circle back to the first through third best projects and, and execute them. A key element of that is deliver. How do you deliver? Well, Ag Gateway as a process and an infrastructure, a technical infrastructure and, and staff that make that happen. So members propose a project. And again, Ag Gateway's members include all the, the major global players in agriculture, plus regional players presently in North America, Latin America, and Europe. The next step is Ag Gateway issues a working group call for participation. Ag Gateway and members together kick off the working group. Members do the work. They execute the project. They produce deliverables. Uh, of course, Ag Gateway then publishes those deliverables. We call all deliverables from our working groups digital resources, standard guidelines, tools, best practices. And then uh, the agriculture industry, and this is critical, use the published digital resources to support integration projects. That is a key element of it. Uh, you can develop all the standards in the world. They don't do you any good if you don't implement them or use them in some way. And then finally, it's repeat, repeat, repeat. And you just keep that cycle going. You plug into a, a broader global community if you can, leverage what they have, contribute New Zealand brain power and ingenuity to the rest of the world. So anyway, that's my pitch. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Kenneth for introductions. Thank you, Jim. Can I encourage all the uh, participants uh, attending to use the chat line, uh, the chat facility on your screen to send questions and comments to, to Tim and he will uh, curate those and we can handle those either on the fly as each of the next three presenters are speaking. There'll be a short period at the end of each if there's a particular point that's worthy of uh, discussing at that juncture or we may uh, hold them over until the 30 minute Q&A towards the end. Thank you, Jim. With that, I'm happy to hand to Sir Bill, uh, well known in New Zealand and globally. Uh, Bill, we've, you and I have talked about uh, the topic today. Uh, Jim, could I get you to uh, drop the presenting and we'll go to full size screen. And thank you. And now I'm happy to hand over to Bill and we're all ears 
to hear what you've got to share with us. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you very much, Kenneth. Uh, the um, I have uh, a real interest in this particular uh, topic because of uh, considerable experience in government, both working within the government system uh, to integrate data across government, uh, and also watching industries that we interacted with, uh, industries and groups. Uh, struggle with trying to get value out of big investments they'd made in IT uh, and infrastructure and not really knowing the value of uh, the data that they held. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is uh, just run through uh, one example um, that shows the power of integrated data and shows why it's worth going to all the trouble because it is quite a bit of hassle and then talk about a few of the lessons that come out of it. Uh, I'm pleased to say with the material Jim just presented, <coughs> uh, I, recognize a, I recognize in that a refined process which took us a number of years to learn uh, was the process that, that, uh, that actually mattered. Um, you need to have in mind all the time with this integration process why you bother doing it. Uh, because it is a bit of an arm wrestle. It's an arm wrestle with management who don't understand the value of data. Um, it's an arm wrestle with technologists who guard it like it's um, like it's gold bullion, and uh, can, you know it can all look really complex. Well, there's two reasons in the ag sector, and, and these are this, these observations are drawn from watching them in action over the years. One is just uh, knowing your customer better. Uh, you know, the ag sector is a bit like government ag government agencies. Government agencies exist in a lot of silos, just as suppliers do in the ag sector. And uh, they know a lot about their version of what the customer does, but they don't know that much about the customer as a whole. They sort of have a, you know, a general picture that they might be a farmer, for instance, or somewhere in the supply chain. Uh, but they don't know a whole lot about what they do. So <clears throat> integrating data gives everybody a much better picture of the customer they're dealing with and actually is an inevitable evolution of a customer focus. But the re And the reason you're doing it is because of them uh, and therefore the, the greater value you can generate from doing a better job for your customer. Uh, there's a second reason in the ag sector and that's just from watching um, the growth of regulatory pressure over the years. Uh, you know, I can remember the, the dirty dairying campaign where many, uh, half a dozen organisations with multi-billion dollar balance sheets got beaten in public relations by one old guy with a, type, with a typewriter running the fish and game. Uh, and I could never quite understand why the custodians of these large risk-laden balance sheets allowed that particular risk to run wild and didn't do much about it. Uh, well, a key to it is data, uh, because the farming community is now in the position where regulators are responding to political pressure, but they've got very primitive tools for regulating the political processes like area committees and so on, or just volume restrictions, essentially. Uh, and so they're blunt tools and they're hard for farmers to deal with. But one reason that's the case is because we're not giving them better tools, uh, and the industry has the opportunity to lead the argument, lead the regulators uh, in the direction of more uh, higher productivity, higher margin production. Uh, if it gets the information available to it together and starts winning some arguments on the basis of data, rather than sitting back, letting the political process be beat us around, and uh, always coming from a defensive position. Uh, and from what I've seen, the while the data isn't perfect uh, and the science isn't perfect for all of these environmental related issues, there's an awful lot of information there and it's mostly underutilized. So I just want to take through you through an example. New Zealand has the best integrated public service use data in the world. Uh, it's called the integrated, integrated data infrastructure. I was, um, uh, fairly much responsible for getting it up and going uh, at the as a as a um, as a minister, and what it does is brings 
brings together the data about your use of public services. And it's pretty comprehensive. Um, we can account for around about 80% of all New Zealand's uh, government spending, building it up from individual records. So <clears throat> they, uh, they know uh, in an anonymised form uh, where people have got a driver's licence, gone to prison, um, uh, got their kids at school, paying child support, paying tax, and they can link all that together around an individual and you can imagine how powerful that is. Uh, and it shows you all sorts of interesting things like um, if you rank all New Zealanders in the use of public services, 85% of them use half the services and the bottom 15%, the most complex 15%, use the other half. But the public services are all designed for the 85%. And you find this time and again when you integrate data uh, that your service or product um, is only reaching part of the market that you understand and may actually be quite unsuitable uh, for some part of the market that simply wasn't visible to you and you didn't know you uh, couldn't use it. So <clears throat> this data is now is not, not quite so enthusiastically used by the current government, but certainly we used it, uh, and we're able to create investment frameworks which allowed us to prioritise uh, prioritise, for instance, which social interventions are going to give you a better return on capital. There's a direct analogy, and in fact, on some other work I'm doing, we're, we're getting to grips with this, uh, being able to prioritise environmental interventions uh, by, a, by return on investment. And you can only do that by bringing together data from a number of, uh, a number of different sources. Uh, just a few of the lessons out of it. Uh, one is that most people don't want to do it to start with and they have <clears throat> a number of reasons uh, privacy uh, well that's just an excuse actually um, there's there's good understandings of privacy uh, there's good um, protocols for anonymizing data uh, it's not actually an obstacle it's just an excuse uh, the second one is that somehow it's technologically difficult that's simply not the case um, You've seen it through these webinars. While the technology can all sound like a bit of a web of complexity, uh, actually doing it's not that complicated. In government, we built a thing called the Data Exchange for a remarkably small amount of money. And uh, it's a bit like, I think, what um, a Gateway was talking about. It's, um, you know, this is all includes health and all the personal information. It's basically an internal data highway, and you can, the data can only get on it if it's got the correct attributes and permissions and um, it's been operating with no fuss um, for quite some time. So technology is not an excuse. Management who don't understand the value of data, that's one of the biggest obstacles, particularly senior management. Senior management often don't understand the nitty gritty of the business and the business processes. So they don't understand uh, that, data is, that the data is there or that it's important and certainly don't understand that it could be have four or five times the value if it was connected to another piece of data about their customers. So management understanding is pretty limited. Uh, and then you'll get middle management and technology people who uh, are afraid that when someone comes and has, someone else has a look at their system, it won't look so good. That actually their systems are a bit messy, uh, not that useful, uh, stacking stuff away that's interesting, uh, but, but uh, not creating value. So those are all pretty defensive, um, pretty defensive excuses, and I think we're all familiar with them. We've all made them ourselves, um, and they made they'll be made they'll be <coughs> they're blockages. And then, of course, in the ag sector, there's the, there's the commercial uh, commercial issues, and uh, that is a bit tricky because you need to. What well, what it does mean is it, it forces a clarity about uh, what value you're trying to create uh, for your customer. But um, data is, it's, it's a bit like water. The more of it, the better for everybody. Um, not like gold, where if you hoard it, it, hoard it, it grows in value. Uh, so, you know, the commercial issues, you just, just, just have to think them through. But where, where all that pushes you, I think, is in the direction of right back around to the customer. You now, why bother? Well, uh, ag, all the consumer and environmental and regulatory pressures around agriculture all hone in on one place and that is the actual environmental environmental manager 
and that is the Filipino opening the gate at five o'clock in the morning in the dark, uh, or the uh, tired uh, dairy worker hooking up the effluent pipe to the irrigator, and uh, someone somewhere hoping that they're hooking it up the right way or that the gate gets closed when it was, was uh, when it was meant to be and not left open. Uh, and the farmer who's over, farmer, share milker, whoever, um, sheep and beef, whatever, horticulture, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the operator of the business overseeing that. The, the environmental manager is not the regional council. It's not MPI. It's not the minister for the environment. It's the person who makes the decisions who lives in the natural environment. And they are generally the least informed by data and analysis and science. And uh, so what goes with integration of data is tools, simple decision tools. Uh, and what's fascinating about that from our experience in the social arena is that when you get, when you integrate data, even if it's just two or three things, let alone when you can integrate 20 or 30 major databases, they often yield quite simple and quite simple insights. You do not end up with unmanageable complexity. You end up with <clears throat> a relatively straightforward rules of thumb, and therefore you can construct um, reasonably straightforward decision-making tools, uh, hiding all the complexity out the back uh, with the guys in the sweaty T-shirts uh, who know what they're doing. So um, I'm a bit of a fan of it, I have to say, and uh, I think the ag sector could achieve two things. One is um, uh, a much better deal for its farmers. It's you, you, all these suppliers are hoarding the data, and this, the farmers are in this, in this depressing and increasingly isolated position where they're meant to resolve all this complexity by themselves, with without knowing all how all the bits fit together. And I think the other big plus is to get on the front foot uh, in this argument about sustainability, because in the end you'll win that argument with facts about what you can do and what you can't do and what good management decisions are and what, Im what impact really happens um, on the environment. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate your comments very much. Um, I've got a question just to start off. What's been your experience in the farmer perspective on what you've just said? Speaking to farmers, you are one, of course, or you have been. Um, in fact, I drove through Zipton not that long ago before we got locked down. <laughs> Um, what's been your experience in actually talking to not necessarily farming industry leaders, but neighbours, people, farmers? What, what do they say in terms of the way suppliers, um, co-ops, um, vendors uh, treat them in the context of not in solid knowledge about their farm and their context? Well, I think that they, I think they feel they're getting quite a lot more attention than they than they used to. So, I mean, the suppliers used to just treat treat any technology as a sales channel. Uh, now, of course, that's wrapped up in a bit more service. But uh, the farmer, of course, is caught in the web of the different systems, uh, and <clears throat> they oh, you get increasing frustration about that. And also that it's um, it's hard to see how the stuff's connected to their P&L. Uh, you know, farmers just think anything you tell me to do uh, it represents cost. And uh, one reason that they are avoidant when they are about um, uh, you know good, better, sustainable management decisions is because they believe that it's going to cost them more, but honestly, they don't know, and they don't have the tools really to find out. Uh, and to work it out, and they certainly have no capacity collectively to push back on um, the latest fad coming out of the regional council or out of the the, the newly greenwashing suppliers, you know, who are who are becoming as you know can can be as much of a threat uh, as the regulator. So and, and also um, you know the the uh, wholesalers, retailers, retailers can sometimes just have unreasonable expectations. So yeah, I just I'd say yep, getting more attention, but feeling frustrated and need better tools. And I hope I just hope that the um, big supply organisations are listening to that because the next steps are not broadband. That's all there. Uh, it wasn't there five years ago, ten years ago. The next step actually is pulling together data in the way that uh, and doing the kind of projects Jim was talking about earlier. 
Thank you. Uh, so, Bill, I appreciate those comments very much. Um, I'm going to make the most of the time of, available and invite Alexi to join us now. Thank you, Bill. Um, Alexi, as I mentioned before, is the global head of uh, John Deere Labs based in San Francisco. And as we discovered when we were chatting the other day, I was in San Francisco for a conference not long ago, and I actually went past John Deere Labs offices on one of the streets in downtown San Francisco, and I went in just purely out of interest. I don't remember that we met Alexi coincidentally, but uh, what were the chances, really? So welcome, Alexi. We're looking forward to now your comments on taking Sir Bill's very broad pan industry global perspective and giving us the benefit of your ag-specific global perspective. And I'm ready to present your slides um, and I'll move them forward as per your indication. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Kenneth. And um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's great to hear, Bill, your 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 story from a global perspective uh, across the impacts of data and the importance of interoperability on uh, societal problems. And if we think about um, agriculture in, in particular, it, it is, a, is a, as you all know, it is a huge industry uh, and, and facing some quite um, intricate challenges in the, in the, coming, uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so, Kenneth, you can you can start sharing, and and while you're bringing that up, uh, my background uh, isn't necessarily in agriculture uh, until I, I uh, got into the industry about uh, six or so years ago, and, and my my prior experience was uh, also very very closely linked to this concept of interoperability uh, and interconnectivity of data uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, first in the travel industry, which uh, those of you that, that might be familiar with uh, airline booking systems and uh, the history there, um, I was I co-founded a travel technology company and then actually came into agriculture uh, by starting a uh, remote sensing company. And so I have the unique perspective of being both the little guy and the, the bigger guy uh, in this uh, in this ecosystem. So, so if we, th I think again, most uh, most folks on this on this call, I imagine, are familiar with the challenges uh, and have heard the the well used statistic that by 2050 we'll be needing to feed and clothe close to to 10 billion people, uh, and there's no way uh, that any one entity or any one one group can can uh, address this enormous challenge uh, on our on our own, um, and so you know the trends are well-versed here as well to, to everybody. Migration to urban centers, uh, higher incomes driving changes in diets and, and requirements, limits on land. So, so really the way we look at it is doing more with less, right? Uh, and in order to drive some of these efficiencies, uh, we adhere as a, a equipment manufacturer and increasingly technology provider uh, won't always uh, have all of the solutions, and we need to work with others to make sure that we have enough uh, food, fiber, feed, fuel uh, for for everybody on this on this planet. And so, Kenneth, you can if you can please move on to the to the next slide. As as we think about the challenges that uh, we're looking to address to growers uh, from a John Deere perspective, we really want to make sure that our our customers uh, are the most sustainable, the most uh, profitable growers out there. Uh, there's, I would say, three primarily challenges that get in the way of that. Uh, first and foremost is, is variability. Uh, growers and farmers and uh, dairies all have issues around uh, variability in field conditions and weather, uh, in uh, animal health. Uh, it's constantly uh, playing a reactive role. Again, weather, pests, uh, unpredictable costs. You're, you're a price taker in a lot of these situations. Um, and you need to make a lot of complicated decisions as a, as a grower. And then finally, there's constant race against time. You're just along for the ride. So as we think about how do we, how do we make this better for, for our customers and farmers, growers uh, in, in the entire industry, um, really comes down to data. Um, and, and 
if we just go from left to right here on the on the bottom and think about what that means, um, when we talk about better data, it's not just more of it, right? We don't need more data, uh, but we need it organized uh, in a in a structured way uh, in order to enable better decisions. We need it in a better uh, we need better quality data to make sure that we can uh, make those decisions and enable growers and others to make those decisions uh, using uh, better better organized uh, geospatial intelligence. And as uh, as Bill pointed out, the people making those decisions, right, uh, need to make sure that they have that information uh, at their fingertips uh, in the right place at the right time to make it easy for them uh, to make these decisions from this web of systems. If I have 15 different screens and I need to make one decision, uh, it, it's going to be nearly nearly impossible for me to actually make the most optimum optimum decision there. Uh, so that's where things like artificial intelligence can help organize that data, uh, but also we need to make sure that that data is flowing uh, between the, all of the players uh, in 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 the ecosystem that the that the grower is is working. Uh, with. And then finally, we all want better outcomes. Uh, that's really where, where we look at, at Deere's role as where the rubber hits the dirt uh, with smarter robotics, uh, more automation in the field, uh, and enabling our equipment to be smarter to react to varying conditions and, and uh, be very precise in executing tasks to reduce that variability uh, that, that uh, those, uh, everybody in the industry is, is battling. So if we think about this whole uh, bottom part here, the, the key thing that I would say is, as we look at it from uh, being a big industry player is we can't do it, do it alone. Uh, there's a lot of trusted advisors out there that our, our customers, our mutual customers are, are working, uh, working with. So Kenneth, uh, if you can move on please to the next slide. I'll just explain a little bit more about how specifically we think about interacting with this uh, with this digital uh, ag ecosystem and and how uh, deer fits in. So we have a lot of equipment out in the field. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, foundational technologies that we have is this back and forth uh, these these arrows along the bottom piece here, which represent the connectivity of our uh, of our uh, of our equipment. So there's more than 180,000 pieces of connected equipment out there uh, for, from a, a just John Deere only. Um, and that means that there's constantly megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes of data flowing back and forth uh, between the cloud and, and our equipment. Uh, so this is a huge uh, data pipe uh, between everything that's happening out in the field uh, and and um, uh, our cloud, and so when we when we talk about the Deere cloud, just to give you all a sense of scale, uh, we have something called John Deere Operations Center. Uh, it's live in 65 uh, different countries. Uh, it's a digital platform uh, that uh, organizes all of this data, uh, collates all of this data, and provides certain tools for the for the grower uh, and and farmers to be able to use to make these decisions that we talked about. However, at the same time, we recognize we're not going to solve everything for the grower. Uh, the growers and farmers out there uh, use a lot of um, uh, existing tools, existing processes that they have uh, in play, and we want to enable that and we want to be able to support that. So that upper right uh, part here, uh, where we refer to uh, as connected as connected partners, uh, is really key, and we. We see that about a third of our, uh, between a quarter and a third of our uh, growers use uh, one form or another of another, connect, you know, digital software partner. Um, so if we, if we, you know, get get even more more tactical there, and what you know, what does that what does that mean? Uh, it means that a grower uh, or their their trusted advisor that has an account in the cloud uh, can connect uh, virtually cloud to cloud. Uh, using uh, APIs and other um, intermediaries uh, to move data back and forth between between the cloud. So make decisions uh, with your trusted advisor, with your software provider, uh, and then move that data 
uh, between our clouds and down to our equipment. So something as, as specific as using an, a remote sensing aerial or satellite image, uh, you can create that and, and uh, capture that on your own. You can combine that with data coming from Deer's equipment, uh, specifically yield information. You can collate the two, uh, and then you can create a prescription that you can then push out to the piece of equipment. So again, it's not something that just Deer does. It's what's really important is that collaborative, uh, collaborative interface. There's a, there's really I, I would say three pieces that that underpin this this relationship between Deer, the customer, and other uh, third party software providers. Uh, one is this notion of choice. So we we want to make sure that the grower and the farmer uh, they have the choice of who they want to work with. Uh, be that in, you know in some cases competitive software tools, competitive equipment. Uh, it's their it's their seed advisor. Uh, whoever it is, we want to give them the choice uh, in order to be able to uh, make the decisions that are best for them and best for their operation. As part of that, but another key leg of the stool there is control of uh, the data in, in, the, in their accounts that their equipment is collecting. Uh, I know some of the earlier sessions touched on this, uh, but we take that extremely seriously and we don't, we don't, uh, we don't take that responsibility lightly. So we ensure that the grower is is who is making that decision, or the owner of that data is making that decision, to share that with a third party, uh, and be able to think of it as flipping that switch on or off. Uh, and you can build out the whole the whole slide here, Kenneth. And the on the yep, perfect. And then the third leg of the stool is really what underpins all of this is, you know, as much as we would love to uh, have all of our customers uh, be running deer equipment, green equipment and, and deer technology, uh, that's of course not the case. And uh, our growers have a variety of tools that they use, a variety of operations. Uh, so compatibility is a, is a really uh, important linchpin uh, to enabling everything that I, that I talked about today. So even though we do have one of the largest uh, uh, digital ecosystems out there with um, more connected software tools than others, we, we again need to make sure that we're thinking about it as a way to have a holistic solution for the, for the customer um, through this, uh, these green arrows at the bottom of connecting to other software solutions, other OEMs, um, other, other display types, other technologies. So you'll you'll see that's why Deer is signed up to the ADAPT standard. We participate in ISO XML. Uh, we're also involved in Ag Gateway, um, and we also have other industry consortiums that we've uh, we've taken a very strong lead on, such as uh, uh, what we refer to as Data Connect, uh, which enables uh, data to flow back and forth between other OEM clouds, uh, and that's something that. We started uh, initially as a small project and are now rolling it into some other standards that are that are out there, uh, particularly being led by uh, AEF over in Europe. So just to wrap this up, as I as I think about New Zealand, and I've been fortunate enough to spend a lot <laughs> a lot more time here than I anticipated, but I was also back here for uh, field days last year and, and just thinking about the variety of uh, agricultural activities and the innovation and ingenuity that. That we that I that I've observed here, uh, as 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 I think to how can we potentially work together better as an industry, uh, not building our own uh, individual data stores, not trying to build our own uh, solutions in a vacuum, um, is is really something that that holds true I think across the industry. No matter if you're in large ag, uh, if you're on high value crops, or uh, if you're if you're a, a dairy farmer. Uh, we all need to make sure that um, that data is able to flow back and forth to serve our ultimate customer. Uh, it's not about uh, storing the data and uh, you know just holding on to it and and not letting anybody else access it. So with that, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up and uh, give it over to you, Kenneth. Thank you, Alexi. Uh, that's very interesting and informative. And a couple of questions coming in through that period while you're talking. Um, first of all, one from Stephen, 
asking if it's not commercially sensitive, can you tell us you know, the platform, the cloud, uh, cloud platform that you prefer to use? And if so, how do you then integrate across multiple platforms? So is that specific, is the question specific to the technology stack? Yeah, no, more to do with the cloud platform, AWS, Azure, that kind, sure. of, that yep. kind of level. Yeah, yeah so, We've uh, recently did uh, announce publicly that it, it, we are on AWS. In fact, we're actually uh, some of the largest, we're, we're the largest uh, user of AWS um, in the industry uh, to the point where we actually work with them very closely in order to make sure that, you know, when, when harvest is coming in, in North America, uh, we have the technical uh, backup uh, from them to be able to handle those vast quantities of data. But to be clear, in order to work with with gear through our APIs or some through some of these uh, standard protocols, you can be on any cloud provider. Thank you. And a supplementary question then: how how do you go, how does John Deere go about managing those relationships with with what you call connected partners? So we have a dedicated uh, team, uh, primarily based out of uh, our ISG office uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, as well in, as in San Francisco. Um, just for context, those that might not be familiar, ISG is our Precision Ag uh, Technology Arm. It stands for Intelligent Solutions Group. Uh, and we have a number of centers uh, around the world that both do technology development as well as uh, partnerships. Uh, so we have a group dedicated called the Digital Partnering Team uh, that works with this host of partners. Uh, and we also have colleagues in uh, Europe as well as in South America and uh, Australia as well that they cover the region here. And thinking locally, uh, happy to um, do any follow-ups. Thank you. And and thinking locally, um, you've obviously got um, well-known dealerships across New Zealand, particularly in the in the hardware, you know, in the, in the green machine area. And and particularly, can I just comment? It's really nice to have some uh, attendees today from some of your distributors in New Zealand, which we're pleased to have on board. Likewise, I'm hoping to pay him, pay him a visit when things open up a little more. Thank you. Uh, one final question. Um, how do you overcome challenges with adoption uh, in the digital ag ecosystem, um, particularly as farmers age? Uh, you know, the, the age, the bell curve of farmers age is, is not necessarily conducive to technology adoption generally. Um, what's been your experience from a global perspective? Um, on that particular aspect of tech adoption, particularly in context with the bell curve of age distribution in the ag sector. So that's something that, that comes up a lot and is, is very uh, relevant, uh, I would say both in North America and, and, and globally as well. Um, you know, the way we look at it, so in, in driving adoption, I think there's, there's, a, few, there's a few key, key, key elements. Uh, first is you need to make sure that whatever solution you're providing um, provides value that's tangible to the grower. And I know that's been something that's been, been covered in the earlier webinars. Um, and, and that value can, can actually sometimes be uh, completely in a different area than what you originally designed the technology for. Uh, and just giving an example of that, we have AutoTrack, which is a, a guidance system that, that uh, allows a customer to be very precise in, in driving their equipment within a few centimeters of where it needs to be. And initially that technology was built out primarily to make sure, you know, as a, as a cost saving feature saying, hey, if you, you know, if you're doing some application, you're not uh, over applying uh, by, by covering the same land uh, twice. Um, but the value that we found was actually, that was driving a lot of the adoption um, was slightly different in that a lot of growers just said, hey, this is great. I'm, I, I'm spending 18 hours in a cab and I'm not as tired. Um, so so that's, the, that's the first piece I would say is just uh, making the value, um, value proposition uh, very clear to the grower and adjusting it as needed uh, has really been a learning for, for us. Um, and then specifically to the, to the genera generational shift, uh, we've actually found that that's helped things along a bit because uh, you see growers that might be passing on uh, their land or, or getting ready to do that. Uh, and the next generation has actually been driving, helping drive the adoption of technology. 
uh, especially if they're not in the same place where they, they might be traveling back and forth uh, to, to the farm. So we've actually seen that as an, as an opportunity uh, to help um, that, that collaboration piece between generations. Thank you. Just one, thank you, Alexi. Just one final question from Scott. He says, what's the, um, what's JD's pricing strategy or charging policy in terms of setting up an API and then also for exchanging data? So generally, uh, with, with, with respect to APIs, we don't uh, currently charge uh, any, any fees for that. Uh, that's an investment that we've been we've been making in our in our platform um, with the intent that as long as long as it's driving engagement and it's driving adoption uh, that's how we recoup our investment um, you know the important thing i would just say there is we want to make sure that a you're abiding by the rules when you're when you're uh, subscribing to the to the system so you're not packaging up grower data and and reselling it you know to hedge funds and things like that um, so you have to abide by the by the rules of the road, uh, and you need to be providing value back to uh, our our mutual customers um, to make sure that again we're we're ensuring better outcomes for them. Thank you, Alexi. That's a good point to finish on because um, that's one thing I think that New Zealand has uh, been quite uh, adept at, and that is um, being able to recognise the value of our farm data standards. Uh, when we get to Andrew after David, uh, we may touch on that. But uh, being a smaller country um, and also being pretty straight up sort of people, you know, we 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 rank number one usually in the in the um, um, best of breed for uh, lack of um, fraud and and so on. We're, we're very highly ranked in that sense. And then of course in the ag sector specifically, as a subsector of New Zealand society, um, we're a pretty small a group of uh, people in the industry. And it doesn't take long for uh, you know malfeasance to be exposed. So for all of those reasons, we've got a pretty good standard in New Zealand, um, and we're also very uh, proud to have had you um, representing a global brand today. So with that, I'll uh, move to David. Thank you, Alexi. Um, David, can I now invite you to uh, to join us? Uh, turn your camera on if you would, and uh, happy to move you over to being a presenter in a second. Um, David, just by, quickly by introduction. Um, I'm sure everybody knows who you are, but if there's one or two who don't, uh, David's leading the industry task force in terms of bringing together a number of, is it four ministries or five? I know it's M, M, MPI, MB, uh, yeah, MFAT. MP, Callahan Innovation MP. and uh, New Zealand right. Growth Capital Partners, so six actually. Six, right. So with that, David, we're look, keen to hear now as we, we narrow this, this um, perspective from Sir Bill being sort of global all industry, um, Alexi being global ag industry, now New Zealand ag industry. Uh, over to you, David, and thank you. Uh, kia ora, thank you, and thanks, Kenneth, for having me here. So I am one of those confused uh, government officials that Sibyl was talking about earlier. Um, I work for NZTE, but I've been seconded to MB for a period of time to help work on a government and industry joint collaboration around the agri-tech sector. Now, quite a few of you, I'm sure, will have heard a little bit about this. So I'm going to go, I'm going to try something out here and go through this very, very quickly for just two or three minutes, just kind of present um, what we've been working on. And then uh, I thought I would just ask a few open-ended questions and maybe try and get some input from from people in the in the audience as well. So uh, let's see how this works now. I've made you a presenter, David. You have indeed. Now I'm just trying to work out which screen you'll be seeing because I've got two. Uh, we're seeing the one with somebody swimming, so we need, you might need to swap to your other screen. It's your yeah, choice as you set up. Let's try that. Hang on. I've got multiple screens. What happens if I do that? Uh, that's the one. That's it. And then if you turn that into a lot, a, a show on PowerPoint, that will fill your whole screen. Perfect. Is that working? Go to go to presentation view uh, version. And, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're away. That'll do. Very good. Thank you. So, um, yeah, what I'll do is just quickly for a couple of minutes talk about this thing called an industry transformation plan, uh, what it is, you know, kind of frame it up a little bit, and then um, specifically around the data standards and the and the, what we're talking about in this seminar, kind of drill in a little bit on that. I'll also give you a bit of an update in terms of what we're now thinking given COVID-19 and the, and the potential response to that. So, Essentially, as Kenneth mentioned, there's a, this is a, a piece of work that is uh, from a, a joint government task force. 
uh, probably a reason to run a mile if you're a, if you're a politician like Sir Bill. As soon as you hear government task force, you think maybe things won't get done, but hopefully they have been. Essentially, we've got six government agencies who've been asked to come together and work on a single plan, you know, which in itself is quite innovative, to to focus on agritech. And I've been kind of leading that team, as I mentioned, MB, NZTE, Callaghan Innovation, MPI, and New Zealand Growth Capital Partners, which used to be called VIF, in case you haven't heard that phrase before. And we've essentially been working with the industry, particularly with Agritech NZ and PANS, you know, and now the two organisations are one, but working with them in partnership, developing um, what was originally a strategy for Agritech and then this this phrase of an industry transformation plan got a bit of um, cut through in credence. And so we essentially now call it an industry transformation plan for the Agritech sector. Um, we we over the last year or so, we've been working on that. It's a sort of a strategy for the sector, and then it, it turned into a um, from the strategy becomes an action plan. Like, how can industry and government working together uh, have some significant impact to increase our impact? But uh, we were aiming to launch this about a month ago now, and obviously that didn't happen. So with COVID nineteen, we had to delay the launch. Uh, great shame, really. Um, however, we are continuing to work on this in the background, and I'll come back to that shortly. So an industry transformation plan is designed to be uh, worked and developed in partnership with the sector, uh, defining and agreeing a, a vision and mapping out you know, the current state, the kind of global state, where New Zealand is strong, where we have um, opportunities to improve, um, where, what are the obstacles, et cetera, et cetera. And then from that, move into something quite practical, like, okay, what are we going to do about it? So this piece of work we've been doing you know, relatively publicly in terms of publishing interim versions of it over the last uh, nine months or so. And uh, we landed on a, a, an action plan that we were about to push go on, um, which I'll come to shortly. We're looking at the total agri-tech sector. And I always want to point out that this is, and you know, people on the call are probably more educated than I am about this, but the, the key thing here is, is don't think just uh, gadgets and widgets on farms this is also well that's true it's also meant to encompass things through the supply chain and the value chain of agritech so through the cold chain potentially you know into export um, it's meant to think about digital solutions you know about about genetics um, plant varietals etc so it's quite a broad definition of agritech and essentially the problem statement we're trying to solve is how can New Zealand uh, become more of a world leader uh, in measured in terms of exports, but also in terms of productivity. Um, how can we become a leader in the agri-tech space? Uh, we defined a joint vision. So this kind of fits in with that, what I just said there. So a globally competitive agri-tech ecosystem, one that um, provides meaningful jobs and value adding companies, and one that, you know, fundamentally, what's our reason for, for being here? Well, agri-tech has the opportunity to solve um, some quite big challenges from a sustainability point of view as well as being an export uh, growth driver. So essentially that, that's a very short version of the background. The ecosystem um, we point out there, uh, essentially I, I always like to really make sure people understand that this isn't, this isn't a point solution in one particular uh, thing, because that's not going to make a difference. You know, when you look at it from a joint government, industry and research um, perspective, really there's multiple parties involved, as you can see here, all with kind of an interplay between them. So there's no, you know, while it's tempting to think that all we need to do is this one thing, uh, basically, uh, essentially, we, I think we have a whole ecosystem of activity that we need to work on. And so basically, we, we split our proposed work streams into, uh, into two big parts. One is around some core work streams that focus on that ecosystem I, I talked about earlier. And these are things that are system level, kind of quite, you know, embedded ingrained things that potentially need to change in order for us to accelerate the growth of agritech. So that's the sort of first set of work streams. And then the second set of um, things are some some specific projects that that came up that basically um, are really good, you know, typically industry-led uh, initiatives where we think if government got behind and really piled in behind um, industry, we could accelerate the growth of these high-impact projects. So, um, so essentially the um, these ones here are, are around, ones around horticultural robotics, ones around a nutrients project, a global nutrients project that we want New Zealand to be part of, and ones around a specialist venture capital fund, which um, 
which we are now uh, kind of working on as well. So those were the high impact projects or are the high impact projects. And as I mentioned, we've also got these six work streams, uh, which um, or underneath it, all of these uh, have a bunch of actions and activities that government agencies, industry, research organisations and others uh, have prescribed to them. Where we were at, as I say, we were launching this about a month ago, was that action plan um, had been kind of finalised and progressed. It was uh, um, an item in the budget, Budget 2020, um, had some activity around this that, were, that was funding basically about a two to three year program of work uh, plugging in underneath all of these things. Like many things, um, you know, that had to kind of go on the back burner a, a little bit with COVID. Um, however, we are actively working with Treasury and MB on what is the what is the role of Agritech, how does it fit into the government's economic development and response plan that will be announced as part of the budget in a couple of weeks' time. So I remain, you know, pretty confident that that uh, quite a bit of this work will will continue. But We'll, we'll cover that in a second. The final slide I'll show, and then I'll open up for questions, was just drilling in on this this one here, this fifth um, pillar around data interoperability and standards. Essentially, what the work program here is to um, see if I can hide that. Oh no! See if we can um, really solve what seem to be some pretty uh, intransigent issues or things that have been stuck in the New Zealand agritech system for quite some time, and you know have been worked on. A number of times but we think with some energy and enthusiasm and particularly the role of MPI and MB um, behind it we might be able to um, work with industry to solve some of these challenges around data interoperability and so these we've we've made them some start on this um, we had a, a workshop a couple of weeks ago or a couple of weeks before the lockdown we focused uh, we had a lot of the people um, come together focusing on what particularly use cases might be how could we really explore uh, the challenges around data sharing and, and data standards and data interoperability, how could we explore that through the lens of a few use cases? And so that's um, a piece of work that uh, we're working on at the moment and we'll also um, uh, work very closely with industry to try and progress that over the next six months or so. In the version of the ITP or the kind of the post-COVID version, this is one of the items I've said needs to be a priority because it's A, it's within our control and B, it's if we, if we do have disrupted international trade flows for the next year or two. That's a good area for us to really be spending quite a bit of effort and energy to resolve some of our kind of homegrown issues so that when we do emerge into the global economy, we've got a, you know, we've fixed some of the foundational elements. So I'm going to pause there or stop there and um, and I'm going to basically hand it over to, to any questions because I think it would be useful the things I'm really interested to hear from people, by the way, would be what would be the specific activities, actions or use cases you think would be useful for us to explore if in the next year we, we did go down that track? And um, and then who should be involved? You know, what's the kind of key system around this stuff? So I will I will pause and let people have some input. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, please, stay, please stay on the, on the camera for a moment um, because a couple of questions. Um, right. And I'm hoping, uh, um, if, I'm sure Collie, I won't mind if I introduce him flat-footed. Unfortunately, with this structured webinar, it's not designed for um, attendees to uh, be converted into presenters on the fly. Um, so, Collier, can I invite you? Um, you can you can use the chat facility. Um, uh, um, I thought it would be useful if if you could just to give us a steer, even if I chat and I'll pass it on, um, as to the work that you've been leading post the, the uh, workshop that put a lot of effort in that uh, David just referred to in Wellington. But can I just back away a bit first, um, David, and get your take on this little funnel that we seem to have produced conceptually today, starting with Sabelle's comments, coming off the back of all the work that Jim's provided us over the last um, three weeks, and that you know the thick end of 100 people um, have participated in. There's, but there's been a lot of knowledge transfer and a lot of um, comments coming backwards and forwards. Um, so there's a there's some quite groundswell of of interest of commitment. Um, there's a lot a lot of conversations going on between various parties. How do you see building on the workshop, uh, the the 26 February workshop in Wellington, where there were 53 people? There was a high representation from government there. I think 70% of the participants were government or local government, regional government. Um, this 
there's been a, a somewhat a, a, a reversal of that. Um, more commercial people um, at, in, in proportion, so about you know the opposite way around, 70% or more of commercial. How do you see these two work streams now merging? The 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 practical government momentum that let's say was centered around the 26 Feb, and now if we can call it this, and I don't want to sound presumptuous, but let's say that there's a bit body of momentum being built out of this uh, webinar series. How would you like to see, and how can you both contribute and benefit from a uh, coming together of those two um, sets of uh, participants? Cool, a lot in that. Gosh, Kenneth, you managed, you managed to cram a lot. Um, so essentially, I'd say a few things there. First of all, the ITP uh, or the work that we're doing is designed to be a joint kind of initiative or piece of work across industry and government. So government has a big role to play because a lot of the levers at the system level are ones that government controls through regulation or policy or whatever, or funding. Um, but actually, the reality is that the industry needs to be the ones who lead the kind of practical implementation. And the work that um, Collie is doing is a good example. I'll just jump in on his behalf because it might be quicker. But Collie is leading a piece of work for MPI uh, around what's called integrated farm planning. So looking at all the tools and systems that are involved in the farm planning mechanisms and how can they work together better. Um, Collie and, and, and I have worked uh, on this idea of taking that as a lens through which to look at some of the, as I say, some of the issues around data sharing and standards in um, agritech. And um, and we're we're landing on a, a few different particular use cases that we think are very valuable for um, for the farmer and you know everyone else in that sort of farm value chain. Um, things like around overseer or you know or managing um, nutrient and nitrates. Um, potentially the value chains around um, production of particular crops as well. So there's a few um, kind of use cases we think that if we we sort of mapped out that use case and sort of look at who are all the players that play a part in here. I mean, you take, for example, reg you mentioned regional councils have a role, you know, um, spreaders or, you know, um, organisations like DEA, for example. How, you know, who has data? How does it get shared between them? Who owns it? What's the sort of conceptual models around that? So going back to, you know, your question about that, that big picture funnel and how does it come down to New Zealand, really there's some some quite big questions that are sort of at a principal level about you know who owns data and who's got responsibility for data. And then that's got a funnel right down to, right, okay, but in a particular interaction, then how do we make sure that um, you know it's it, the right parties are involved and they're consciously using the right information. What we discovered, or we sort of well, discovered it, what we sort of discussed at the, at the workshop that we all had, that a few people on the call were at, was actually while the technology is really important, you know, we've got to have standards and all that sort of stuff. Actually, that that's by overshadowed by the need for this kind of trust relationship and some kind of key principles around trust and, and ownership. So I think actually what we'll see over the next few months and year in this particular program work stream for Agritech will be defining those kind of principles and then basically making sure the technology can deliver the, to the principal level. Okay, thanks, David. Then, then a follow-on question, um, and then I'll go back to some questions that have come from the audience, from the attendees. Um, what do you want industry to do for government, and what's government going to do for industry? Gosh, I mean, that's we good question. government. I mean, real practical. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I always say government's here to serve industry and to create the conditions for industry to be successful. So, if if there's anything that it is, it's based around feedback and involvement. Um, Agritech NZ, for example, Peter Ren Hilton is is pulling together a series of work groups that will marry or, or match up with the work streams that that um, the ITP has, and that's you know a very deliberate strategy to make sure that industry is very involved in the decision making at each level. Um, so that would be the first thing is get involved, you know, through Agritech NZ. Make sure you're a member if you're not one already, because that that will be a key channel, not the only channel, but a key channel that we use to get to the sector, and. Um, People like yourself, Kenneth, and you know Peter are fantastic um, advocates for for the whole industry, not just for your own particular piece. So that's part one. Part two is probably any practical or specific projects that you think go, um, government should be involved with. As I mentioned, we were doing some, you know, we looked at some high impact projects, things that we we said actually, like while this is industry led or might be research led, actually if the government got in behind this through resources or funding or policy change or whatever. Um, we could really accelerate things. So if there are specific examples of that, that would be what I'd, I'd be after too. So so as I say, the, the request for industry is more around input and involvement uh, than anything. 
Thank you, David. I'm going to open up and invite the, the other panellists to join us again, and let's try for bandwidth. Uh, Andrew, I'd particularly welcome your comments now. You've been involved in the webinars uh, two and three, and it would be very helpful to get your take because you've got, I think, a good, um, a, a good interface between boots on the ground um, work that you do with with a number of um, New Zealand ag tech business or ag businesses. Um, you're also in the Waikato, which is a distinct advantage, um, and uh, and because you've got a number of players around you there that are that are either leading the fray or dragging the chain in terms of uh, interoperability and collaboration. Uh, and of course, you've been on the journey with us. So I'd welcome. You, I'll give you the open mic. You go first, and then um, I'm sure that that'll stimulate some more questions coming through on the on the Q, uh, Q and A line. Andrew. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm hoping you can hear me all right because I just rebooted my computer beforehand. Great. Turned on the microphone, yes, so that's all good. Um, yeah, so you're right. Um, uh, Razier is, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a software development company who does effectively contract software development, but only in the agricultural space. And we work in New Zealand and Australia and the UK. And we've been fortunate to work in the data standards and code of practice space since probably 2012, 2013, doing work with Dairy NZ and, and Beef and Lamb. Uh, and so uh, I, I guess I've seen a lot of this sort of stuff and, and our more recent projects have been with AHDB in the UK, uh, with, uh, with ICAR in Europe and, uh, and with meat, uh, meat and Livestock Australia. And the same questions, of course, are being asked globally, which is why Jim's input has been both uh, so valuable, but also his experiences working in this space in the US have translated exactly to the sorts of things that we are working on and trying to address here in New Zealand. So the same issues of how do a group of organisations try and collaborate together around data standards while still being competitors. How do they put aside the fact that they have this attachment to farmers' data that they kind of see as their own and actually uh, put the hat on about, well, we can all gain more value of this if we can share it effectively without reinventing the wheel? Um, let's move to a couple. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Let's move to a couple of questions. Um, um, a question from Andrew. Uh, uh, for Alexi, um, API agreements as discussed by John Deere, who should be leading these API data flows and how do you think individual companies uh, who provide software tools should hold government or uh, data or government, should it be the, the government or uh, um, data providers or, or government regulatory bodies? Where, where should this data be housed? I, I think I know the answer, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, going, to, I'm going to defer to your much greater knowledge. Uh, Sorry, re repeat that the last half of yeah. that question again. Yeah, it's a curly one. So I think it's I think it might be a, a that question may have a sting in its tail. Um, API agreements, as discussed by John Deere, who should be leading those API, API data flows? The individual companies whose who software provider. No, oh, there's a little typo in the question. I've got to reread it. The uh, individual companies. Uh, he's talking about software companies um, who hold the data. Or should the government regulatory bodies ultimately finish up holding data about farms? And then I'm going to get your comments, Alexi, and then I'll ask Sibyl. So I'll, I'll respond to, to the two parts, uh, two parts yeah. in there. Uh, with respect to data flows and, and, and API agreements, uh, our approach has been uh, to, again, really put the end user, the, the grower, uh, in control of that, that data. Um, and, and I emphasize control because I send you an email. Who owns that email? It's on your PC. It's on my PC. Ownership is, is, a, bit, is a bit fuzzy. But when we talk about control, uh, it's, it's pretty clear. So you know, our, our API agreement is, is standard for any company that wants to, to join. And it's predicated on the fact that uh, the, the grower has, uh, has control. Uh, of that of that data flow, uh, so that's where we really uh, really emphasize that. Um, you know, in terms of of uh, where the data lives, uh, you know, I think we're we're seeing an environment where uh, different uh, 
entities, uh, governmental entities around the world are are being more strict and specific about what data privacy means, what data control means. Um, and, you know, everywhere from California to GDPR in Europe. Uh, and and it's, it's uh, you know, I think in the end, it's going to be a balance, right? Um, we, we, we abide by the regulations. We expect uh, other connected software partners to abide by the regulations. Um, you know, I don't see the, the data necessarily living on government databases. Uh, you know, uh, happy to entertain a discussion around that, but I just don't see that necessarily happening uh, in the uh, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Hence my question about it having a sting in itself. So, Bill, would you like to comment on that particular question? Because, as you say, the the, the, the value of data is in, inherent. Where does it reside? Uh, well, just to start on it, David referred to this issue of trust. A whole lot of work was done over four or five years around um, government trust frameworks around personal data under the Data Futures Partnership. Um, go and have a look at it because it'll, it's not the same as um, the AG, but it's got all the principles there around governance and control and so on. It doesn't need to be all done again in the way that government always bloody does everything all over again. Uh, second thing about where it should lie, um, it, with the customer, it's customer control. And that's one thing that worries me a bit about the Agritech plan and the ITP. You have to ruthlessly, to make the integration work between entities who don't want to cooperate, which is what you're dealing with here, right? There's a bunch of entities who do not want to cooperate. The only reason they'll do it is if you have a relentless focus on the customer and the value to the customer and the customer driving the suppliers to do it. And anything that's even vaguely disconnected from that will just get lost in the fog of good intentions and tech, you know, technical differences and all that complexity you can kill yourself in. It's got to be absolutely ruthless. And when we did the uh, social services stuff, we spent you know a couple of years saying, no, this is in the end, this is about a mum sitting in a state house with a disabled child, and uh, and she's got benefit debt. And every time they wandered off on racism and anti-colonialism and you know economic downturns and things, say no, no, it's about this person here, and so it's about this farmer trying to make this decision about uh, about his effluent nutrient management, and whether he's going to come out ahead or behind, while he's still wor while he's worried about methane emissions, and if, and you've got to stick to that, and then people, then your then the customers will trust you because they will certainly distrust government holding data uh, to be used for government purposes. That's not data integration. Well, it might be a government's version of it, but they're not gonna go with that, and nor should they, nor should the industry. Thank you. Andrew, I can see you're busting, fizzing at the bank to contribute. Um, um, unmute your mic. Oh. Yeah, I was look. I was just agreeing with that as well, and um, and and look, the Bill's comment about uh, organisations who are, are not really willing to to share data. Obviously, everyone's looking out for their own best interests, uh, and and I, I I love that that ruthless focus on what the end user, the end customer, their needs are. Because you know, I certainly know of one uh, cooperative who said to me a few years ago, and the CEO is no longer the CEO, so it's fine to mention this without any names, uh, who said, um, the problem is if we agreed to data standards, people would expect us to share data using them. And it wasn't the data standards that were the barrier, it was the sharing <laughs> of data. Very revealing. Thank you, Andrew. Right, a little change of tone. This question from Andrew, and it's for David. Uh, the Aparima Catchment Group in Southland is currently collaborating with the regulator, Environment Southland, on a self-assessment and intensive winter grazing initiative. The question is, do you think MPI or like should be involved with data collection or is it just the local regulator? In addition, should the farm environment plan be industry and processor led, not central government led? Golly, that, that way there's a lot of landmines there for a government employee answering those questions. And uh, Sir Bill's watching me like a hawk, so I'm very conscious. First of all, I can't answer on behalf of any other government agency um, because I'm not MPI. So I'd go back to what Bill talked about because I thought it was bloody good actually. And it all sort of flips the question. 
for a farmer sitting in Southland thinking about, you know, adhering to these sorts of principles and projects, what's useful for them? Um, and if if it's useful for central government to be involved, then maybe we should be. But if it's not, then maybe we shouldn't. And the example that I've heard that sort of really validates some of this is the example that is used quite often around things like regulation around water in um, local authorities and local catchments where different regional and territorial authorities have got different standards. And so therefore it makes it very difficult for a farmer who's got multiple holdings across multiple regional authorities, for example, to know and to accurately, you know, give back information to those regional authorities. That, for example, for me would be one where it does make sense for central government to get involved and say, hey, you know, like Bill said, no one, no one wants to do this, but you're going to have to because the fact that you're not working together is causing pain for the farmer sitting trying to reconcile information. So I think that's always the lens to look through, and I, you know, completely agree with Bill on that one. Thank you. Um, you're the you're the um, going to win the vote for popular. Uh, uh, questions, David. I've got another one for you. Is there a government funding mechanism to support industry's participation and contribution to the Agritech ITP work streams? At the moment, the, the, the funding mechanism is, is part of the Budget 2020 process. So in other words, it's sort of budget secret for another couple of weeks, um, which sounds like me being slippery, but the, the honest answer is I don't know. We've certainly asked for, you know, what happens in, in these processes is different government agencies sort of pitch up to Treasury and, and various um, decision makers, kind of here's our ideas on how we could deliver the plans that you've asked us to do. And we ask for a certain amount of money to deliver that. And then we'll get given an allocation. In the budget request that we made, we certainly put in money for industry participation and involvement, yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean we've got it. We won't know that yet. Thank you, David. A comment uh, for Sir Bill's uh, comment and reply. Uh, from David, we know that both regulators and pharma tools are still blunt compared to where they need to be. How are we bringing these parties to the table and, and, and a, a part of the conversation within the ITP, i.e. ITP, how do we actually bring the customer to the ITP table? Uh, that's a, a comment for you to uh, reflect on, Sibyl. Well, look, I'm not part of that process. Um, and I must say that if multi-billion dollar cooperatives are waiting around for a funding stream from a government agency in order to participate in this. That is ridiculous. The governance of these organisations requires them to manage the risks their shareholders are exposed to. And one of their big risks is regulatory risk and the other is big shift, shifts in consumer demand around sustainability. And they should be investing their own time and their own money in solving their own shareholders' problems, not waiting around for the government to, to pay for it. And, and actually, I found generally in, the, in these exercises, if the government's paying for it, the industry doesn't value it, and so they don't really stick to it, even if they come up with some nice plan. Uh, that's the first thing. So I've got that off my chest. <laughs> the, um, yeah, what was your other point, Kenneth? Uh, the, the, second, the second point was, uh, well, no, I think you've addressed it, to be honest. Um, look, conscious of time, we've got 10 minutes to go. Uh, thank you to, to, those, to all the presenters for the Q&A session. I'd now like to pass back to Jim, um, because all the talk in the world doesn't make anything happen. It's good preparatory work, but we've got to turn this into action. There's a significant um, degree of enthusiasm and commitment uh, that I sense around the country, um, and uh, we're all in that together. Um, nobody's particularly leading or following. I think it's a it's an emu parade. But Jim, can I invite you to go back to your uh, slide eight? I think it is uh, slide seven, um, and present that. I'll need to make you a presenter. Um, there we go, uh, Jim, the panelist at the moment. I'll just convert you over to being the presenter. There you go. Right. Um, and could could you take the next five minutes um, just moving through those uh, three or four slides? because then we get to the closing where I'll wrap up with a call to action and an invitation for some very specific steps from um, from the attendees. Jim. Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, I had two key slides. Actually, let me back up a slide um, in terms of getting started and, uh, again, a process. So, again, uh, identify two or three projects this, uh, that, that meet the following criteria. Addresses a clearly understood problem. Deliverables are clear and implementable, can be completed in six weeks or less. Domain and technical experts are available to contribute. 
And again, I, a really key point of this is, you know, uh, the ITP, again, I've read it carefully. And, and again, I think it's impressive work. Um, I've read a lot of government documents, uh, huh, some not so impressive. But it's, it's really, um, you know, it, it, it lays out a, a plan, and that's great. And so you might be inclined to say, okay, uh, we need a giant strategy that's perfect before we take the first step. Yeah, go ahead and, and work on a coherent strategy. Uh, but in the meantime, or as a first step, get going on a couple of projects. Um, you know, the, the, there's, uh, I think David mentioned, uh, join Agritech uh, New Zealand, uh, get involved in some working groups, whatever it takes so that, that you begin to build up trust. It, it, I, I mentioned earlier that I, that I had a conversation with a farmer who, who has started a company that provides services uh, to other farmers uh, for, for managing contracts on harvested commodities. And, and again, one of the questions he asked me was, well, how does that gateway get all of these companies together? How do they get Trimble and TopCon in the same room? John Deere, CNH, Agco. Uh, working together, and and I just sort of laid it out to him. It 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 takes time to build up trust because, and it's not so much that these people engaged are fiercely competitive at the technical level. It's that they know their companies are fiercely competitive, and they they have to be very careful about what they say, what they commit to, how much information they give up to build a collaborative base. It takes some time for these contributors that are more in technical areas or in areas that sort of span business and technical to get comfortable with how they work with each other to solve problems in agriculture. So that was getting started. And again, the process, this is not rocket science. Uh, this, this apply, and it's not, it's not ag specific. Um, it, it's pretty simple. Propose a project. You know, again, this is an ag gateway perspective. Member companies propose a project. It could be one company. It's usually two or three. Um, let me give you an example, actually. So, so, uh, Alexi, uh, was, was being, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, his, his comment about John Deere being involved in ADAPT was, you know, it's a little bit like saying Sir Tim Berners-Lee was, he was involved in the internet. Um, you know, John Deere proposed a project in Ag Gateway. Ag Gateway, you know, issued a call for participation. Then, and then we, we built a coalition. John Deere helped lead a coalition in Ag Gateway of bringing competitors and partners across the industry together to do the work. We kicked off the working group. We executed the project. We produced the deliverables. We published deliverables, and um, and then people are implementing it. So now today, there's an open source project, and we covered it in uh, the I don't know, second or third webinar. And I mean, even today, there's dozens and dozens of emails going back and forth. You know, how do I calculate the entire width of my implement? Is there some sort of summary level? level value um, or do I need to, to you know sum up the widths of each component I mean there's people working through the nuts and bolts of, of data uh, transfer so anyway yeah and by the way this <laughs> the example I gave of adapt that was a big project but I would recommend starting small so Kenneth back to you thank you, you want to on thank, any you. Of that? thank you very much um, Let's just take that. Uh, I think we're done with that presentation now. Oh, no, no, actually, we've got a couple more slides to go very, very quickly. Would you like to go to slide 10, um, Jim? So thank you, everybody. We're coming to the close. There's, this is where, what we've covered. Um, today, we've uh, completed um, the, the broader breadth and the, with a very specific New Zealand focus. Three specific actions I'd like to invite everybody um, and this is somewhat, this has obviously been discussed across the panel of folks in PANS that are supporting this initiative um, and uh, for, for whose help I'm very grateful. Uh, we all are. Um, the first thing is uh, to make sure that if you're not already a member of AgriTech NZ, that you sign up and become a member. 
Um, the vast majority of attendees have been Agritech members, but there are many who aren't. And I know that um, the whole organisation of Agritech NZ, with now the PANS membership move, moving across and merging, and the work of PANS continuing in the PANS Working Group, which is a, a department or a, a body within or alongside Agritech. So the, the farmer focused precision ag adoption focus that's been ag, uh, PANS's driver continues. But in terms of back end administration and singularity of membership and so on, that comes under Tech NZ, under the AgriTech NZ banner. And AgriTech NZ, as we know, continues to focus on ag tech businesses, which is about supply, while PANS continues to focus on farmer uptake, which is about demand. So uh, a big invitation uh, to everybody in the webinar series who would like to become an, an ag tech member, go to AgriTech NZ website and you can sign up there. The second thing is then that that leads to say, we're very open and uh, 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 welcoming what could be considered projects. We've, we've made the point loud and loud and plain throughout this recent part of the webinar series that what gets things done is doing smaller projects quickly and, and efficiently, staying in scope and staying in time, not allowing scope creep or time creep to take over, um, but to get specific initiatives up, going and running, albeit within a wider framework for sure. But as Jim has said, it's better to do the fourth and fifth important than to plan to do one, the first and second and not get around to doing it. Uh, so the third uh, specific initiative then is to invite uh, feedback, comment, um, advice, recommendations. Uh, I'm happy to um, curate those emails and to share them out across the people that have been supporting this, particularly from the New Zealand perspective. So Peter Ren Hilton, the Executive Director of AgriTech NZ is with us today and uh, the, the um, establishment board of AgriTech is moving in the next few days, in the next couple of weeks, to a voted um, executive council. And anything and everything that you would like to contribute and, and um, submit and propose, uh, I'm very happy to collate those and share them with Tim, with Andrew Cook, uh, Tim Cutfield with Andrew Cook, um, and also with Peter, if there's anything that you want um, to contribute that can be spread more widely, by all means, share it. Uh, I know Collier Isaacs are now on contract for MPI and David Downs working for MB across the government departments are um, all ears and very keen to have input and feedback. So with those three things, I'd like to conclude by thanking, first of all, Jim, for a sterling effort over a month uh, of time, uh, you you run a lot of these webinars around the world and a lot of in-person conferences when circumstances permit. And we've been very grateful and appreciative, not just of this last webinar series. To me, this is the icing on the cake. You've been working with us for three years now, Jim, throughout the whole time that I've been leading that little group within the little subcommittee of, of um, PANS. And we're very grateful for your commitment uh, to this work in general and to New Zealand in particular. Uh, it seems to us that we get a far greater share of your attention than a small country deserves, uh, but nevertheless, we really appreciate that. So thank you, uh, Jim, very much for your time over this, this whole period. Then to today, um, Sybil, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Um, you're obviously a very um, busy person and under a lot of demand and have a lot of pressures on you, but we're grateful for you making the time available today and to give us the insights of your breadth of experience and wisdom. Alexi, um, a, just a great uh, opportunity. We're very grateful that you were in New Zealand, as I said at the start, and we're uh, very thankful and appreciative of your time and contribution today and for your wisdom and knowledge and your willingness to share it with that. David, you're well known and well respected, and we all appreciate the work that you're doing, uh, not just with the ITP and, and Agritech generally, but you've got a couple of other things going on um, which are quite neat. We, we like your SOS business initiative and so on. So thank you again for that. Um, and then specifically to uh, the, the two uh, collaborators that have been in full support with me all the way through, uh, Andrew Cook and Tim Cutfield. Thank you all as well. So finally, just thank all the participants. There's been 166 people involved across this whole initiative. And we look forward to further conversations. And we trust this is just another, in, another initiative and another um, puff of wind in the sails of driving this um, whole process forward. So thank you all very much.
and uh, uh, with that we'll close because our time is gone. Andrew, I've just seen you come to the screen. Did you have something you wanted to contribute or just saying goodbye? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all and we'll leave it at that and look forward to seeing you uh, all in good time. Thank you and goodbye.